Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Insider Risk Community Trailblazer event. My name is Abik. We're really excited that you're part of this discussion. Um, and I am sure it's going to be exciting, it's going to be insightful, and all of the above. Um, now, many of you are probably here for a, a variety of different reasons. We'll start with curiosity, right? Maybe some of you are here uh, as you're developing your insider risk programs. Some of you are concerned with malicious, non-malicious data loss type uh, use cases, um, or you're maybe just here to simply engage in some good old fashioned insider risk versus insider threat debate and banter. No matter what the reason, I think this is gonna be a fantastic opportunity um, you know, to hear from our speakers, hear from what's going on in the industry and glean some, uh, some insightful takeaways by the end of it. Um, you know, when we did this, and by the way, this is our, our second iteration of the Trailblazer event, but one question that came up last time was, well, why did you call this Trailblazer? You know, what's with this whole Trailblazer thing? Um, and I think it's important for everybody to, to recognize that, you know, just by you being here, you're shaping one of the newest categories in the uh, information security space today, right? As we think about insider risk, as we think about the category itself, where it's going, this is a relatively new category and it's still developing, it's still shaping based on what's going on around us. So it's a very interesting time, obviously, to be a part of the discussion, but all of you, you know, as you ask this question of what does Trailblazer even mean, just kind of look at yourselves, right? Everybody that's here, that's part of this discussion is essentially a trailblazer. Um, and in essence, everybody, by the questions that you're asking, the discussions that you're being a part of, you're really establishing the roadmap for how companies are thinking about this problem too, right? Um, whether that be better managing insider risk within their organizations, educating colleagues about what creates risk, and of course, safeguarding data as well, right? So, you know, as we, as we think about the event, as we think about what we could best bring in terms of education, um, common themes that often tend to come up is, tell us more about insider risk problems, right? Tell us about uh, the typical everyday problems that security teams have to deal with. Uh, and as we know, insider risk problems vary, right? They, there's a broad range of what constitutes insider risk. But as you think about the, the everyday things, departing employees, remote hybrid workers, you, you think of situations like data infiltration, not just exfiltration, but you know, the type of information that's coming into organizations that could be you know, a lawsuit waiting to happen. Uh, there's been a lot of interesting discussions around awareness and education as well. So you know, these are just a few topics that we are going to try to unpack and understand. So again, you know, thank you for being here. Thank you for your leadership. Um, and before we move further, I do have some very quick housekeeping for you. Now, as you can well imagine, we, you know, we've been on, on enough Zoom calls over the past few years. Um, everybody is on mute by default. However, that doesn't mean we don't encourage questions. In fact, the more questions we have for our um, you know, esteemed panel, the better, because I think the, the best part of this is at the end when we get to go through our Q&A session. So please be thinking about your questions. Please feel free to chat those in. Um, and everybody is on mute, really just to provide our speakers with, you know, the, the, the optimal experience to get through their content as well. So I'm going to very quickly, just a little bit about me, you know, I get to be your virtual host for today's session. Um, I am someone that is very passionate about the insider risk management space, uh, and I've closely followed uh, that progression as well. So in my discussions with the analyst community, for example, um, CISO roundtables, or even seminars that I get, I get to attend, um, you know, the discussion that is ensuing and where this, this whole category is going um, is exciting to me, right? So naturally, I wasn't going to miss this opportunity to host, you know, our second trailblazer. But hey, enough about me. Let's uh, turn our attention over to the agenda and our speakers. So we are going to kick things off with Joseph Blankenship, who is the uh, VP Research Director with Forrester. He's going to kick things off with a three-pronged approach for de-risking insiders. We then are going to turn our attention to the training and awareness side of the house, and Brandon Liker from, from Optiv is going to walk us through that. Uh, then we will get a much needed break. So depending on what time zone you're in, that might mean coffee, it might mean lunch, what, whatever it, it might be. But here's what I can promise you, right? If you don't have enough of a caffeine intake by then, 
um, Sam Humphreys is here to save the day because if any of you have ever listened to Sam Humphreys, she brings the energy, she brings the excitement um, and her session on how long is a piece of insider risk will no doubt deliver. And lastly, we're gonna get into a very interesting topic from Clea Astendorf. Um, how do you report up on insider risk, right? This is a common theme that comes up. How do you report up to management, right? What are some of the key metrics that you wanna, that you generally wanna to provide to your executive leadership teams? So definitely looking forward to that. Um, and then of course, like I said, we will have a dedicated time for Q and A at the end. All right. so. Just if you want to put some uh, some faces to the names here, here is our esteemed panel for today. Uh, but honestly, without further ado, you know, let me first introduce you to, to the first of those speakers, um, Joseph, who I am going to refer to as JB for the remainder of this presentation. Again, the VP Research Director at Forrester, um, and he supports security and risk professionals, um, helping clients develop security strategies as well as make informed decisions to protect against cyber attacks. JB, over to you. We're looking forward to your session. Excellent. Thank you, Abik. Really appreciate it. And uh, this is quite possibly my favorite thing to talk about. I guess that probably says a lot about me that talking about insider risk and insider threat um, is my uh, <laughs> my favorite topic to, uh, to get into. And as Abik kind of hinted at, um, I am going to get into a little about that you know, quote unquote debate about insider risk versus insider threat and give you Forrester's take on how we define those two things. And hopefully that'll stir up some, uh, some discussion as well. But why is this one of my favorite topics? Well, so I, learned, I first got involved with insider threat or insider risk, I guess, years ago because I worked in retail. And like a lot of you know, young people, when they work in retail, they, they crave excitement. One of the things that I really enjoyed about my job in retail was working with our loss prevention personnel. Uh, and basically that involved me tackling people uh, in the mall sometimes or helping to Maybe stop shoplifters. Sorry, please forgive the interruption. Are you sharing slides, yes or no? Yes, I guess Zoom is not allowing slides to share. Hang on one moment. It Sorry. wouldn't be a Zoom call without the occasional snafu. Sorry for the interruption, just wanted to make sure. No, no. Awesome. God, so we'll, we'll roll this back one frame. So it was, without, the, without that preamble, this talk track makes absolutely no sense. Uh, so hopefully you're seeing slides, slides, uh, slides now. Um, Good. So where I was going with this, right? So one of my favorite things to do was to work with loss prevention. And occasionally that involved you know, tackling people or chasing them across the parking lot to try to stop them from stealing merchandise at the store. So imagine my surprise when one day I'm just sitting there and I'm, and I'm you know, working out there. It's probably doing some folding. If you've ever worked in uh, retail, most of your day just involves folding things, right? And one of our loss prevention people came up to me and he says, you know, hey, uh, by the way, have you have you ever seen our store manager? And so we'll we'll just we'll call our store manager Tim to uh, protect the not so innocent, right? You know, I'm like, have you ever seen him go into your stock room or you know do this or do that? I'm like, well, yeah, he's a store manager; he can go wherever he wants. So basically, kind of giving the store manager sort of unfettered access to everything in the uh, in the store. You know, so I didn't really think anything about the questions until one day I'm also standing there folding. And I see a bunch of people, including the head of regional loss prevention, uh, our loss prevention folks, and some other people kind of walk through the front door of the store, walk to the back. And then about 10 minutes later, they emerge with Ted or Tim. Yeah, I just gave up his name uh, with Ted in, uh, in handcuffs. And so imagine, you know, my surprise to see the store manager being walked out in handcuffs, right? And that's because he was an active insider threat. Uh, one of the ways that he, I guess, uh, entertained himself was to walk through departments, pick up merchandise, take it back to his office, and then put it in his uh, bag to take home at the end of the day. And he had repeated this uh, often enough that they had developed a pattern uh, and then uh, got, uh, you know, I guess, probable cause to you know, search his office and then, uh, then fire, have him fired. 
So, you know, definitely learned about insider risk at, a, uh, at an early point in my life. And I think kind of understanding the mentality and the psychology of people who do this uh, has just always had maintained a fascination for me. And so since I'm the lead off speaker here, and I don't know the backgrounds of all the folks who are in attendance, and oh, by the way, thank you all for being here uh, today. Just want to kind of do a couple of pieces of level set, right? When we say insider, who are we talking about? Obviously, we're talking about, about employees, you know, people like our store manager or myself, the, the lowly retail employee. We're talking about our contractors, people who are giving access to to do jobs on our behalf. And maybe business partners, if they've got system access, if they've got application access, maybe we're sharing data with them. Uh, so anybody who's got access to our systems or data, and that includes vendors. Many times we're outsourcing things to vendors and giving them sensitive data, maybe you know customer lists, financial information, that type of thing. So an insider can be any one of the above, right? Because even if we you know, give the data to the partner or the vendor, it's still our data, we're still responsible for it. So when we talk about insiders, this is what we're talking about. And I talk about insider threats as three, you know, kind of big, broad categories, right? One would be compromised accounts. Somebody has got a user or an insider's you know, authentication credentials, and now they're acting as if they're that insider to get access to whatever information that person has access to and then misuse it, right? That's a big part of you know, compromised account. Why do I want those credentials? So I can go off and do misdeeds with them. Then there's careless misuse like our unfortunate person here with the ladder and the table and the cinder blocks and the electric meter. Uh, this is a, a bad idea, so don't try that at home. Uh, but it could just be that you're you know, either unaware of policy and, or you're aware of policy and think, yeah, you know what, that, I, I, I don't need to follow that policy, right? I can just you know, do what I need to do to get my job done and things will be fine. Then we accidentally have a data loss event or whatever that person does may constitute a data loss event, uh, something like that. And then you've got that last category, the malicious insider, and that's like our store manager, right? The store manager was actually a malicious insider. That person was actually taking things on purpose. It wasn't an accident. It was accidentally on purpose uh, by putting things in a bag, taking them home. You can kind of think of the same thing with your data uh, or with your uh, intellectual property or anything like that, right? So three just kind of big, broad types of insider uh, threat or insider risks. And we'll get into what, what the, how I define the difference anyway, momentarily. Now, some of you, you know, may be thinking, how big of a problem is this, right? Because what do we hear about? We hear about outside actors, we hear about hackers, we, we see all the stuff, you know, like the uh, image before with the people in black hoodies and stuff. Right? How often does this happen? Well, in our data here at Forrester, and by the big part of what we do at Forrester is research uh, and surveys. Like one of the things we do every year is a really big uh, security survey where we go out and ask people what their experience with these things is. And one of the things they tell us is 24% of data breaches in the last 12 months were the result of internal incidents. And you can see there in the pie chart how that breaks down. So you've got, you know, abuse or malicious intent, you know, sort of the insider threat, the malicious insider makes up about 35% of that number. And then the accidental um, insider threat makes up about 33%. And then there's some combination of both, right, where during the year they've had multiple data breaches and it's a combination of both those types. So a lot of this stuff ends up being more that malicious sort of intent. If you look back, you know, kind of over time, we ask this question, you know, annually, and we, so we can trend it. Uh, you can kind of see our trending data here that says, you know, hey, over the last five years, more than 20% of all data breaches for our survey respondents were caused by internal incidents. We see a big dip there in 2020 when suddenly, if we did not have good uh, process and technology in place, we weren't really able to see a lot of insider incidents uh, because people had a lot of what we had used for uh, policy uh, control uh, had gone blind or become useless because folks had gone home. We saw that tick back up in 2021 as we saw you know, lots of people implementing uh, better insider risk controls and take kind of taking uh, you know, ownership of their data again. 
and you kind of look at this over time as well, and over half of those insider incidents are malicious over time. You can kind of see the trending here about you know malicious intent versus you know mistakes, accidental, and then both. So over time, malicious incidents make up a big portion of the insider risk or insider threat. So how do we de-risk insiders? So we've kind of determined that we've got your know, actual real risk of insiders. How do we how do we address that? What do we what can we do as security professionals um, to address that? Well, first I want to kind of get into what do we what do we mean at Forrester when we say insider risk versus insider threat. So you can see here in this graphic, we've got a coiled up rattlesnake. You know, the rattlesnake's just sitting there minding its own business. You know, typically if a rattlesnake is uh, upset, it'll shake its uh, shake its tail at you and let you know, hey, I'm a rattlesnake, don't mess with me, right? But it's coiled up. It's not really posing as a threat at the moment unless we go over and poke it. By the way, I do not recommend poking rattlesnakes or snakes of any sort, uh, never, never a good thing. But it's kind of, what is the risk of this person based on their level of access? What are they doing? And any predispositions they may bring with them, you know, things like ideology, um, political motivations, um, past evidence of perhaps, uh, you know, data theft, anything like that. A lot of the stuff that we might uncover during a background check, you know, things like that. So insider risk is sort of the, you know, what is the, the risk based on who this person is, their level of access, what can they get to, uh, and then a lot of their behaviors and so forth. Sort of like the rattlesnake, right? Not really posing a risk. If you're walking down the trail, the rattlesnake could be off under the brush, never bother you. Now, what happens when that person becomes threatening? Well, it's like the rattlesnake. Now, it, the rattlesnake is ready to, ready to strike. So it's that, an action taken by an insider that results in either a you know breach of data, maybe some da system damage, kind of the sabotage sort of a thing, or it could be financial fraud based on their access and their knowledge of systems. Now, one of the things that makes insiders you know, particularly dangerous, just like our, our snake here, is everything that they do is based on knowledge of your systems, perhaps your security, and the data or systems that you have, and they've got access to. So, you know, they actually have a, a little bit of an advantage where they can stay a couple of steps ahead of any, uh, any security mechanisms you've got in place just based on who they are and what, they're, what they have access to. So what does that mean? I mean, how do we, how do we address, you know, that level of risk uh, that exists out there? Well, we have to understand first what makes them risky in terms of uh, behaviors and motivations. So this is a list of motivations. Why you know, do insiders do the things they do? Well, it could be financial distress. Uh, maybe they've got a gambling problem, uh, something like that. Perhaps they've got, they're going through a, a divorce. You know, it, it could be anything like that that's happening. They could be disgruntled. They could just be unhappy, right? Uh, they may not like some company policies or something like that. Uh, very often it's a sense of entitlement, and this happens a lot with things like source code, uh, sales uh, contacts, uh, and intellectual property, right? Because, hey, we, I gathered all this, I built this myself, I should be able to take it with me to my next job. And so I have the, the sense of entitlement that I should own the data myself and do what I want to with that information. Um, another could be an announcement of fear of layoff, so we kind of understand, right, that a layoff could be happening. So now I want to hedge my bets. I want to go gather some data. I want to get ready for my next uh, my next job. Maybe I want to go ahead and grab all my sales leads if I'm a salesperson so I can go off and be uh, be ready at the next thing. Um, could be revenge. Maybe something happened to that insider and you know either uh, by the the company or by you know a coworker and they want to be able to get and take revenge against that. Sometimes it's work conflicts between individuals at work that you know, make it rise to the level of uh, insider threat. A lot of times it could be ideology, you know, so, sort of a political motivation, perhaps some, some, something else uh, that's going on that they've brought with them uh, that has made them decide to act. It could be that they've got a feeling that what the company is doing is wrong uh, and they want to right the wrong in some way. 
And then we've got outside influence. And this is one that is particularly, uh, you know, sort of, sort of dangerous, especially for malicious insider, where we've got people from the outside who are approaching insiders and either offering money to get their credentials, right? So now I can be, you know, compromise that account and, you know, steal data as if I am that insider. Maybe I'm paying them to take data and give it to me, especially things like intellectual property. You can think of sort of nation state type of motivations where nation states are trying to get intellectual property or, you know, trade secrets, that type of thing, and then paying that insider, or maybe, you know, blackmailing them, putting them in a, uh, in a bad spot, that type of thing. So it could be some sort of outside influence that's causing that insider to take a, uh, a risky action. So I believe that de-risking insiders requires sort of a multi-pronged approach. So we talk about all the motivations, we talk about the different ways insider threat or insider risk kind of manifest itself. So no single approach is going to quote unquote fix this, right? There are a lot of things that, uh, that we've got to take into account. One thing I you know, want to stress too, right? When we talk about insiders, what are we talking about? We're talking about people that we trust, right? So we can't just go around willy nilly trying to just lock everybody down, make everyone feel like criminals because that actually will spur more insider risk to be quite honest, if they feel like uh, you know, it's, it's oppressive. Right, so we actually have to create a, a, a more positive experience and not make this sort of oppressive. We also need to be able to trust people to go and do their work. At the same time, we you know we have that you know trust for the employee. We have to you know make sure we're following good security controls. Now, one of the things that kind of that. Um, I saw on Twitter, this is, uh, you know, if anybody is active on InfoSec Twitter, you likely know Hacks for Pancakes, uh, AKA Leslie Carhart, uh, who is quite uh, prolific and a, a well-respected incident responder and security researcher. And so she, she had tweeted this out one day, you can see here in 2020, and this was in response to a uh, insider incident that had happened where uh, the insider was actually paid you know, to give up credentials. And you know, she identifies these three things. Now, hey, if you had done these three things, perhaps this would not have happened, right? Uh, you know, practice least privilege and compartmentalize access to information. Uh, you know, look at uh, you know, monitor monitor access. Who is accessing data? How is that data getting used? That type of thing. And by the way, don't treat people like crap. Treat them well. You know, pay them what they're what they're worth. You know, don't give them motivations to turn uh, turn turn risky or turn malicious, right? And it made me think, you know, hey, if, if we kind of address these three things and maybe get, take it a little more broad than that, then maybe that's a great way to de-risk in, insiders. That's what, what kind of made me think, if we have a good approach to culture, we implement zero trust as our uh, as our control, as our preventative control to make data safe and be able to give people access and monitor that access. Uh, and then monitoring, building a security program. And it, the program includes process, it includes people, and then it includes technology last. And I'll kind of go into why I, I kind of focus on, on putting the tech last and the process and the in the team sort of ahead of that, right? But if we get kind of good at these three things, then we will be able to you know, de-risk our in insiders uh, significantly, and then also set ourselves up for response should an insider threat actually happen. So let's kind of dive in. What do we what do we mean by this? So culture, you know, sort of like Leslie said in her tweet, don't treat people like crap pay them what they're worth, right? So promote a positive employee experience. Uh, you you kind of look at what does that mean? That means everything from onboarding, right? We're bringing somebody, you know, on board, you know, we're trying to fit, make sure that they're happy, that they're where, where they need to be for success. Uh, we're, we have our salary uh, and promotion guidelines, you know, sort of in line. We have a good program for diversity and inclusion. Uh, we're not make, trying to single folks out. Uh, we're really kind of promoting a positive employee experience or EX. You can kind of see here on the right, you know, what are some sources for, you know, auditing that, that EX? How do we make sure we're doing a good job uh, as a company or as an organization in keeping our people happy and not motivating them to turn 
you know, more risky. Another thing we have to do is build a culture of security. And when I say that, and I say train users, right, those are very related. I'm not talking about security awareness and training uh, types of activities, that awful stuff that sometimes, you know, we as security professionals put people through uh, for compliance purposes. What I'm actually talking about is one, letting everyone know what the safe data handling policies and your and practices are in your organization. What can they do with corporate issued access or devices for giving for allowing employees to access anything using their own, you know, laptops, tablets, mobile devices, etc. You know, how do we how do we tell them to safely use that stuff? And by the way, we have to let them all know. Security and protecting data is a responsibility of everybody. For one thing, we talk about the accidental uh, insider, right? The kind of the accidental data loss. And people say, I wasn't aware of the policy. Make sure they're aware of the policy. Train them, let them know what safe data handling looks like. Uh, you know, have ways to remind them and nudge them in a positive direction about safe data handling and following policies. Uh, there's no need to necessarily be oppressive here because what we're really trying to do is kind of bolster everybody so that they think, hey, I, I've got a role to play in securing all of this, uh, all of this data. Now, another thing, so we talked about the privileged access control, right? So this is actually why Zero Trust was in, uh, invented in the first place. This is the entire um, origin story of Zero Trust is really controlling access to data and systems, right? Because if we can control that access, um, then we're able to protect the data from moving into places or being accessed by folks who should not have access. And the way that we do that, and anybody who's familiar with the, with Forrester's approach for through a trust knows that we've got, you know, basically four you know central uh, control pillars: you know, people, data, network, uh, and analytics, right? And so when we talk about people, we're talking about who is the user, you know, what, you know, what, where are they from? You know, what is the, their potential motivations? What is their current status? You know, are they brand new? Have they given a, uh, have they given notice? These are things that could you know, say that they're risky. Uh, have they demonstrated, you know, to us that they've got some behaviors that maybe are questionable? So who is that person? Uh, what is their role in the organization and what projects are they working on? What systems should they have access to? Is there a way uh, for us over time to kind of learn their access you know, habits and then you know, build controls around those access habits? And what is the normal you know, for that user, especially through the ways that they interact with our systems, and more importantly, with our data itself? So then we can you know, determine over time the appropriate level of access based on the, the risk of the person and based on least privilege. If I don't need to have access maybe to HR data or me you know, as, a, um, as an analyst, maybe I don't need to have access to next quarter's financials or that type of thing, right? Uh, then don't, don't grant that access. Don't make that uh, part of the thing that I can get to. Another big piece of this is data. You know, know what kind of data we have, um, you know, in the value of that data, where is sensitive data you know, kept uh, so we can you know, keep a closer eye on it, also an employee, uh, you know, systems protect that data um, is, or encrypt that data if, at rest, uh, that type of thing, right? So we want to be able to, you know, have data protections in place. We want to look at you know, data use, how those people interact with it, track the way that data is transacted across systems. And basically this means, hey, we've got to monitor uh, how all of this stuff is, uh, is being, uh, being used. When we get to the principle of network, now we're talking more about things like micro segmentation, creating secure enclaves uh, for data. And if you kind of get way back into the history of zero trust, one of the way, one of the reasons that uh, it came about in the first place was PCI compliance. Anybody who remembers the old days of PCI compliance, and I guess we're getting back into the retail thing again, right? Uh, the old days of PCI compliance, things were wide open. We realized that put the entire network at that time in scope for PCI compliance. We, you know, kind of learned, hey, we've got to create secure enclaves where we have things like PCI data and cardholder systems. So it's just not you know easily accessed from everywhere. So we want to be able to limit lateral movement you know across those environments. 
And then lastly, you know, good analytics. You know, we want to be able to do monitoring of user behavior, file behavior, look for anomalies, look for uh, types of behaviors that are especially risky. So now we can respond to it. If we include a couple of things here too, uh, as part of the zero trust model, that we want to be able to enable investigation. We want to have an evidence. We want to be able to manage a case. You know, should we have to investigate somebody? We want to have all the context that an investigator needs to do their work. And then we want to be able to have a quick response. You know, that there could be a technical response. Hey, I just shut down an identity because this person's acting strange. Or maybe I don't allow them to do data transfers because uh, they've demonstrated riskiness. Uh, it could be an HR thing where we have to go and either counsel that employee or that, or that user, uh, or perhaps we have to let them go because of their behaviors over time. Uh, the last piece of that, you know, know when it's time to call law enforcement, right? So we've got to be able to enable investigation and response. And that leads me into kind of the third prong here, which is monitoring. Now, the First thing to think about when we start monitoring employees or users, or we're thinking about, hey, we're going to go have an insider threat program. You can see Forrester's 10 steps to insider threat program mastery there on the right. And you'll notice technology is the absolute last thing. Because the first most important piece of this is have really good process. Know what you're going to do if you think that someone is a risk. Or if they have demonstrated, you know, hey, they have taken data, they're doing something, they're violating policy, have a process in place for handling that. Because the worst thing you could do is say, hey, that person did something, you know, let's fire them. Or, hey, that person did something, let's call law enforcement. Because if you don't have the data, or if you have singled them out, if what they were doing was legit, you know, chances are they're going to end up in court someplace. And so as you establish, you know, what is the risk to your organization for you know, this type of insider activity, you may want to have a, a specific insider threat function. Now, that may be a standalone team where I have a bunch of people who are doing investigations and uh, that type of thing, you know, looking at users. Or it could be that we you know, take somebody from the security team or another team, maybe somebody from the from HR or the general counsel's office, and we say, hey, your job is insider risk. And maybe we don't have a giant function around it, but we make that somebody's job. Why? Because there's a lot of pieces here. A, we can't assume that everyone's guilty. This is definitely a innocent until proven guilty sort of a thing. We have to treat people with respect. We want them to be able to work here. We don't want them to feel oppressed. We also need to be able to have folks that understand how insiders are different than other types of you know, threats or risk that a security team may be responsible for. It's not the same thing as you know, defending against malware, uh, that type of thing. It's a very, very personal, uh, very, very human sort of, a, uh, sort of a problem. So then kind of the last piece of that is you know, to employ monitoring tools to you know, monitor what users are doing. This is security specific, by the way, you know, I strongly recommend to folks that you don't, you know, blend the world of performance monitoring and security monitoring. Uh, you know, this is definitely, you know, keep those two things, uh, two things very, very sec separate. Do we want to do, you know, sort of, the, you know, kind of what Leslie Carhart referred to in her tweet? We want to be able to monitor system access and be able to report and audit that. Is it appropriate? Or is this person doing the right thing? Or is what they're doing you know, more risky over time? They want to understand their data use. Are they accessing data they need for their job? Or do we see them kind of accessing things that are outside of the role of their job or maybe doing things that are unsafe uh, with that data? So then we have the process around that to say, hey, we either are going to coach this person, get them back to norm, or we're going to take some other action sort of based on the processes uh, that we've established. With that, I'm going to wrap up and hand it back to to a beak. And I know we'll be taking uh, questions here at the end, and anticipate a a lot of questions from uh, from the audience. So again, thank you very much. Thanks very much, JB. Um, <clears throat> fantastic insights as usual. And you know, shame on me because usually I like to start these things with a little bit of an icebreaker moment, right? Give our speakers the opportunity to share something fun about themselves to break the ice a little bit. But I think you accomplished that with your retail example earlier on. But if there's something I missed, we can certainly get to that later on, on, on the fun side. But one of the things that you said, JB, that I thought was really interesting is 
this notion of just treating people like crap. So I'd love in the future to somehow somewhere see a policy, an insider risk policy in bold letters that says simply do not treat people like crap. Because I think at its core, that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today um, in the realm of insider risk. And I think your point about building a culture of security fits in very well there as well. So naturally, we get to go on to our next session now, which will be led by Brandon Liker. And it, it, it's, it's interesting because we talk about culture and Brandon is going to talk a lot about, you know, education, awareness and how that fits in. So just a little bit about Brandon, you know, he's been a security leader for nearly 20 years in the information technology as well as um, information security uh, space. Um, across multiple verticals, um, energy, financial services, medical, banking. You know, he has a lot of experience and I'm sure he'll bring a lot of wisdom into this discussion. But before we get to know the serious side of Brandon, um, Brandon, you get to tell us a quick fun fact about yourself and then we look forward to uh, the rest of the presentation. Over to you. Excellent. Thank you for that, Abik. Um, so fun fact, um, I ride Harleys. Uh, so uh, that may maybe not be something that anybody would uh, na uh, guess uh, naturally about myself. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, great to see you all at the Insider Risk Summit Trailblazer event. And thank you for joining this session with me today to discuss the significance of training awareness and metrics in building a holistic Insider Risk program. In the next 20 minutes or so, we'll go over the key considerations for in-service training and awareness optimization, along with several examples and metrics that can be used for measuring its effectiveness. Then we'll expand our scope and look at several other key performance indicators and metrics that are applicable for measuring the maturity and effectiveness of inside risk programs as a whole. We'll conclude this session with key benefits and takeaways, followed by a question and answer session that will be coming later on. Um, as Abik mentioned, um, my name is Brandon Liker. I've been in cybersecurity and technology for about 20 years. Um, my background includes solution architecture, implementation, administration, security operations, strategy, as well as governance, risk, and compliance. I have a master's degree in information assurance management and hold numerous industry certifications, including the CISSP. I'm also the vice president of the ISC squared Wichita chapter. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> in recent years, insider risks have truly become a concern among organizations worldwide. In 2020, it was reported that out of uh, six out of 10 data breaches were a result of insider risks. And the number of these types of incidents grew by 47% from 2018. In addition, according to a study by the National Insider Threat Center, 85% of insider risk incidents uh, someone other than the insider had full or partial knowledge about the insider's intentions, plans, and activities. Therefore, it is crucial to ensure that members of your organization are well-educated well about the dynamics of insider risks to effectively build a security work culture and enable reporting of insider events. However, nowadays, many insider risk programs are lacking two pieces needed to holistically manage insider risks. They are adequate training and effective uh, awareness and sufficient metrics and key performance indicators to measure awareness and training and overall program effectiveness. With people serving as a first line of defense to combat insider risks, many factors should be considered to optimize uh, training and awareness, including coupling, coupling that with metrics so that your organization can empower personnel to become an integral piece of reducing insider risks. Insider risk events exploit gaps and weaknesses in people, process, and technology, and are realized when an insider uses his or her legitimate access to wittingly or unwittingly cause harm to an organization's mission and resources. Training and awareness as a crucial part of the insider, holistic insider risk program also relies heavily on the foundation of people processing technology, and it requires these three building blocks to work together in tandem. Keeping this in mind will help organizations determine the appropriate path towards establishing an effective training and awareness program that is best suited for their enterprise environment, as well as taking into consideration resources, capacity, scope, and governance structure. There are four common motivations for insider risk incidents um, or 
types. They are unintentional disclosure, which refers to accidentally compromising access, disclosing company information or intellectual property, or incorrectly disposing of data. Individual theft, this refers to stealing money, data, or intellectual property for an individual's gain. Malicious coercion, this refers to committing corporate, government, or illicit group espionage with the intent to harm an organization and or its people or gain monetary advantage. And then there's intentional data leak. This refers to compromising the confidentiality of an organization's data due to thrill-seeking, whistleblowing, anarchist or radical ideals or other desires tied to harming the organization. Comprehensive insider training and awareness improves the effectiveness of people, process, and technology to aid in reducing the potential for occurrence and impact of these four types of insider risk incidents. In terms of, in terms of people improvements, training and awareness allows organizations to turn employees that can potentially create the greatest security risks into valuable assets. A group of well-informed and trained personnel can lead to an aware and security-minded culture. In terms of process improvements, with a significant increase in personnel security awareness, organizations can grow their own capability to identify inefficacy in security strategies and procedures, enabling a continuous enhancement of security governance and day-to-day -day operations. In terms of technology improvements, organizations are able to make more informed decisions around tool rationalization and make better use of technology toolkits based on people and process needs. Now that we've talked a bit about the significance of having a well-established training and awareness built upon process, uh, people, process, and technology, let's use that to determine the answer to how do we do that. To successfully move in the direction of training and awareness optimization, we first need to fully understand who will be involved, what key pieces and artifacts are relevant, and how we can transition or transform ideas into real world implementation. First, starting with the who. Insider risk training and awareness should never be limited to only a certain groups of people within the organization. Ideally, training and awareness should be mandatory and repeated on an ongoing basis for all personnel, contractors, and associated th third parties. <laughs> Second, training and awareness should entail important pieces of information, such as the types of insider risks and their corresponding real life examples. Each type of insider risk having universally uh, having a universally recognized and understood set of potential risk indicators within the organization will enable the identify, identification of risky behavioral activities and patterns. Personnel should also be provided with a clear and standardized set of instructions on how to report different types of insider risk events upon discovery. Using this in combination will allow personnel to identify potentially harmful insider risk events around them and enable appropriate and timely reporting in response, reducing the potential negative impact to the organization. Last but not least, once an organization has defined its training and awareness scope and governance, there are many available methods to deliver, which should be mixed and matched to address specific organizational requirements and needs. A couple common approaches would be to implement a learning management system that delivers online training through in-house or in third-party software, formal in-person training sessions, and virtual real-time training sessions. Additional delivery methods include, but are not limited to, security newsletters, posters, and blogs. Now let's discuss some metrics categorized into people, process, and technology, which can help your organization measure the effectiveness of your insider risk training and awareness. In the category of people metrics, we can track the annual click rate of the simulated phishing emails. We can track this as a percentage year over year, as well as compared to industry benchmarks. Next, we can track participation in annual insider risk training and completion rates for the relevant audiences. We can also track that number, um, the number of reported events and provide an indication of how well the organization personnel, the or organization's personnel apply the training knowledge to real life settings and to spot insider risk events. For the process category, we can measure the, percent, the percentage of insider risk program budget that is dedicated to training and awareness. 
We can also track the frequency of training and awareness activities. And by correlating these, we can, with the click rate metric, we can determine the impact on changes to training and awareness budget, as well as frequency. Finally, for the category of technology metrics, we can track the frequency of the learning management system assessments, as well as content updates. And these can both be important metrics to evaluate how well technology assets are being utilized and managed to achieve insider risk training and awareness objectives. Now that we've gone through some common metrics specific to the training and awareness aspect of the insider risk program, I'd like to expand this, expand this conversation to look at insider risk from a holistic insider risk program perspective and look at some metrics and key performance indicators that can be used to measure its effectiveness. But before we do that, I would like to take a look at the eight key areas that organizations should focus on to help them ensure they're establishing an all-encompassing program. These areas are intentional culture. This refers to the creation of a support supportive and risk-aware culture where employees have a sense of feeling the, of their intrinsic value to the company and feel engaged to protect the organization from insider risk incidents and improve the overall security posture for the organization. Next, we'll look at the identity and detect. And this emphasizes recognizing and analyzing anomalous and suspicious behavior and potential risk indicators, and it leverages industry-leading technologies to identify and assess potential insider risks, allowing the ability to respond in a timely manner to reduce or lessen the impact. Next, we'll look at the program management and governance. And this is about establishing the governance, management, and resources for the insider risk program that is focused on developing the program's definition, documentation, and metrics maturation through the allocation of personnel and technology resources while following a predefined program strategy and operating model. Next, we'll look at the respond and report, or report and respond. And this is focused on developing and enhancing the capabilities of timely effective response upon identification of anomalous and malicious insider events and incidents. We'll look at the cybersecurity and prevention, and this refers to the implementation of appropriate controls, such as separation of duties, day loss prevention, privileged access management, and so on that can be used to deter and prevent intentional and unintentional insider risk activities. Then there's the training and awareness, and as previously discussed, this is a crucial part of building a mature insider risk program as it enables a proactive security culture through education and engages all personnel to protect the valuable organizational assets. Next, we'll look at physical security. This is equally as important as cybersecurity, and the controls should be established to protect physical assets from unauthorized access and malicious insider activities or behavior. Finally, we'll look at asset management. And asset management is the key to an insider risk program, as without having a firm understanding of what assets an organization, organization has and where those assets exist, it is difficult to understand what needs to be protected and to mitigate the associated risks. Historically, insider risk programs have been reactive and often relied on the idea of monitoring and reacting. This capability primarily leveraged a focused technology solution such as data loss prevention and security information and event management solutions to manage insider risks versus looking at things from the holistic lens. The issue with this approach is, is often does nothing to reduce the overall number of insider risk events and focuses, focuses merely on responding to them. Another with, uh, issue with inter, uh, traditional insider risk programs is that oftentimes they are siloed within the organization. And as a result, these programs are unable to enable correlation or coordination between business units to identify high-risk individuals and potential issues. Therefore, therefore, by shifting from a reactive to a proactive approach and incorporating multiple organizational functions, a holistic insider risk program provides the crucial elements necessary to reduce and mitigate these types of risks.
besides um, driving security awareness culture, an insider risk program metrics can be broken into four uh, categories. First, we'll talk about the enhancing the security landscape. And this can be achieved, achieved through the implementation of a user and entity behavioral analytics solution through optimizing data resources and tool sets, enhancing security controls in general. Organizations should foster capabilities in identifying and analyzing anomalous behavior, leverage high caliber data sources and tool sets, and align controls within the industry standard frameworks and best practices. Example metrics that fall into this category include the number of false positives that a solution generates, or the average time between suspicious or anomalous event or, uh, occurrence and its actual detection. Next, to reduce risk, organizations should focus on things like potential risk indicators, and use cases, and risk-based analytics capabilities. As mentioned earlier, potential risk indicators can provide an early signal of an increasing risk exposure through the identification of risky behaviors. Through the development of a repository of potential incidents and use cases and deploying analytic solutions incorporating multiple areas of risk, organizations will be able to more effectively mitigate risks and prevent future incidents. Relevant metrics include the number of insider risk program findings from a periodic assessment and the percentage of insider risk program assessment findings that are closed within a defined time period. The next category is build program standards. Ideally, organizations should define and establish policies, a governance model, and an operating model to enable consistent documentation and ensure the program and personnel's accountability. Example metrics in this category include the percentage of controls that are in compliance with a selected framework, such as the NIST cybersecurity framework, the state 171, ISO 27000, or even GDPR. The percentage of policies and standards updated within a defined time period or also another um, metric. There are also metrics applicable for organizations to measure how effectively they are doing when developing formal security operation processes. Here, formal processes refer to repeatable operating procedures, standardized incident response playbooks, and tabletop and other process testing activities. Measurements in this category may include the cost in time or resources per insider risk ticket and the time to investigate or close an incident. We've covered the individual metrics themselves. This is where I'd like to zoom out and discuss the value of these metrics at a higher level. Focusing on the value of training and insider risk program metrics could bring to your organization. These metrics extract, extract insights from raw data and help your organization identify correlations between individual pieces of information that can apply to the organization as a whole. Having training metrics in place will help establish a culture of reporting and empower personnel to become an integral piece of the organizational security, as well as serve as a multiplier for the organization's overall security posture. Implementing this key is key to fostering trust and buy-in as it benefits not just the organization itself, but any parties that are involved within the organization's environment. Ultimately, as indications of return on investment, training metrics can be levered to continuously assess and facilitate insider risk program maturity. Having an insider risk program metrics in place will provide a solid foundation for a strong and constantly maturing insider risk program. These metrics can help identify trends for improved use of resources and evaluate the success of security implementations. They are key to program effectiveness measurement, as well as risk reduction, and increased situational awareness and regulatory compliance. The key takeaways I want you to live with to enlighten you to your strategy and approach towards insurance training and an insurance program at a broader scope are that people are the first line of defense in an insider risk program and organizations must train their people on the potential risk indicators, 
the motivations and reporting. They must conduct regular awareness training and they must measure the program to continuously improve. A holistic insider risk program can help to reduce risk, to increase the situation awareness and to meet the compliance needs. Organizations must build a program that considers people, process and technology and they must measure that program for effectiveness. The bedrock of this strategic advantage to good metrics that good metrics provides is accomplished by choosing the right metrics for your program and organizational goals. They should ideally measure impact, performance, and effectiveness. They should be used as early on in the program or process as possible. <clears throat> Effective measure, uh, metrics do not only allow these programs to thrive, from a capabilities and performance standpoint, but they will also help your team to build a case to your leadership and other business units. This could help establish your program as a key component to the capabilities within the security landscape for your organization, which can help with buy-in and additional support and resources. Thank you uh, for your time today for this session and please stick around for the upcoming uh, question and answer session. Thank you very much, Brandon, really appreciate it. You know, it's really interesting because I, I think on one of the slides you talk about time and you talk about mitigation in terms of percentages, but I think most importantly, you, you talk about cost as a measurement of time versus dollars. And I think that's something that we definitely want to unpack later as we get to our Q&A session. But it is noted that one of the most common questions, one of the most common discussions around metrics is, you know, as the conversations go to the executive leadership team, how do you put it in terms that they understand, right? How, how do you put it in terms that, um, you know, intrigue them enough to take that next step? So there's a lot to unpack there. Thank you very much. Um, we are at time for a break, so let's take about 10 minutes. We'll come back at about 12.05 Central Time, um, and hopefully that'll give uh, folks enough time to go get some more coffee, grab some quick lunch, but uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back and uh, look forward to welcoming Sam Humphreys next. Thank you.
Hi, right, everybody. We will be starting back up in about one minute. Thank you. All right, well, welcome back everybody. Hopefully everybody had an opportunity to go grab something to eat very quickly or get a refill on coffee. I know 10 minutes is a very aggressive, but hopefully you were able to grab something, something quick. Um, I am excited to announce our next speaker, Sam Humphreys from Exabeam. Um, she is the head of the EMEA security strategy over at Exabeam. She's been in the cybersecurity industry for over 20 years. She's helped numerous hundreds of organizations of all shapes, sizes, geographies recover from cyber attacks, define strategy for pioneering security products and technologies, and of course, is a regular speaker at uh, security conferences around the world. So Sam, I'm going to guess, well, there's a couple of things. I'm going to guess there is a couple of fun facts about you. Well, probably hundreds, but you only get to pick one before you kick off. And I'm always curious about the title of your sessions, right? Because they always leave folks guessing. I want to say there was something related to George Michael the last time, and it all made sense by the time you, you started your session. But I am intrigued, probably just as everybody else here, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, George Michael does get a mention in this one as well, not going to lie. Um, all right, have you got the right screen sharing? I hope. You're good. Good. All right, then, let's get this off the races. Uh, fun fact about me, I poured wine on Lewis Hamilton's hand, um, not on purpose. I didn't just walk over to him and be like, woo. Um, it was in my excitement at meeting him backstage at a Grand Prix. Alrighty, um, I don't think there's any Formula One references in this actually, which is odd for me because I'm a I'm a big fan. So hi everyone, thank you for coming along. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed their break. I said hello to my child briefly. Um, so today's presentation is going to be on how long is a piece of insider risk. Um, the easy answer is twice as long as half of it. So thank you for coming to my TED talk. Um, there is a bit more to it though. So um, this is me. This is what I look like probably pre-pandemic with fewer wrinkles and not the old age blonde that you see at the front there. Uh, I think did a lot of the, the uh, introductions already. If you do want to follow me on Twitter, please do. It's not always security stuff, um, so please be warned. <laughs> um, but yeah, happy if you want to re reach out on LinkedIn as well. It's all good. All right. Let's get to the right screen. There we go. OK, so promises were indeed made. So if you did read through the um, the agenda for the event, I hope you did, and that's why you're here. These will be some of the topics we're covering. Um, there are musical references in here, and I hope you like memes. But um, memes aside, there will hopefully be something useful for you during this session as well. So last week I was running a panel at an event in, in uh, where was I? Stockholm. Stockholm. Lovely place. Didn't see much of it, as is always the case with travel. And I put this question to our panel about how they calculate insider risk. And I got this very unhelpful answer. Um, so again, another TED talk. Thanks. Thanks very much. So he just said, we've got a risk team. And I was like, OK, so what do they do? And he's like, I don't know. I'm just a data protection officer. So there we go. Just get a risk team and all is well. But what if you don't have a risk team? Not all of us do. So um, really useful document I was having a look through earlier. Um, it is 73 pages long. Please don't read this right now because you'll still be reading it probably after we've done Q&A. Um, but there's a lot here to talk about if you're implementing an insider risk program, how to manage that, how to review it, um, ideas for measurement in there. It's very, very good. So that would be your light reading for later. So on with the show. Um, Joseph did a great job of covering this earlier. I feel like he's already done half my presentation. So um, I will I will continue along. So, but if there is some repetition, um, that's a good thing. That means we agree. So we need to talk a little bit about lapses. 
Um, but first of all, just to kind of go back on the types of insiders, um, for those of you who were at the George Michael talk last time around, you will have seen this before in some formats. But we've got kind of the three broad categories that Joseph referred to. But underneath that, then, um, many types of, of insiders with different motivations, um, different drivers, and ultimately different risks. But really, it all come back down to credentials, um, your data and money. But why they do this and how you how you look at um, detecting, finding those people will vary based on those motivations. Um, as to, as to what's driving them to do this. So we start with the opportunity, opportunists. Um, they're really seeking to better themselves. That's really their MO. So it could be somebody who um, is trying to circumvent some of your security controls, for instance. So they're looking to get a new position in the company. They wanna get ahead of some of the projects that are going on. Um, they're really doing this for themselves um, at the expense of the organization. So um, if, you know, if they're able to do it and, you know, we've all got tinkerers um, in our organizations, uh, I have to say I've been a, not, a, not an insider, but certainly a tinkerer with oh, what does this software do? <clears throat> what have I got access to? Everybody kind of thinks that way, I think, somewhere down the line. But if I quote my dear friend Chris Tillett, um, the way that he looks at this is that if you look at your employee base, there's probably about 10 percent of the employees who are probably pretty high risk. 10% who will never do a bad thing ever. And the other 80% are somewhere in the middle. So depending on circumstances, motivations, things can change very quickly. Um, the, them becoming an insider can happen. So if you move on, um, those of you who are Hamilton fans, you'll see this will soon switch to Star Wars because that makes sense. Um, the thieves. So they are all about the Benjamins profit. So can they get information and can they sell it for money? So that could be, you know, lots of information has different values for sure. Um, uh, healthcare information, if you're a GDPR fan um, or indeed subject to it, which pretty much most of us are, um, certain types of information certainly have bigger fines associated with GDPR. Um, but on the, on the flip side, there are different, uh, different values depending on the types of information. Um, it used to be you could get an unverified credit card number for cents. Um, I'm sure that's still the case. But um, if they can use your data to make money for themselves, these indeed are our tailors or thieves. All right, let's go to Camp Dooku. Um, so soldiers are indeed conspirators. So they are really there to do damage. So this could be somebody who's from a competitor um, or somebody that has really taken umbrage with your organization. Um, wants to damage your reputation uh, and indeed the goodwill. So um, if we look recently to that, I think there was a Coca-Cola breach in April. Um, this was an interesting one, whilst not necessarily an insider as in an employee, but they were able to get into the organisation um, and use uh, credentials as part of that. They actually ran a poll in a, tele in a group on Telegram to say, who do you think we should breach out of these, these five companies? So um, the conspirators come in many shapes and sizes. I think for somebody who uh, really takes umbrage with your organization to go through the process of being vetted and employed and spend some time there, um, I wouldn't say it's completely unlikely, but um, this is the, where we talked about the importance of background checks early on and really digging into like, who are you employing and what may they may be thinking? Now people do move from competitors to another company, for sure that does happen. Um, and many of them will accidentally or purposely take information with them. So uh, certainly something to be concerned about from that respect. Moving on to our spy on the inside, Lando Calrissian, um, or indeed uh, the, the leakers, the spies. So long gone are the times I think of people being loyal to a company for their, their entire lives. People do move around. We're going through the great resignation at the moment. Um, people are moving regularly. So, and many things can impact your loyalty to your organization. Um, again, Joseph talked about a load of different factors early on. I'm going to cover them in a slightly different way later on. But um, they may decide that it is a, a benefit to them to leak your data to the press or put something on social media. Um, they can be someone who's, I'd say, a conscientious objector, sympathizer, they could be activists, or they might just be doing it for their own self-benefit. So um, we've seen a lot of this, you know, the WikiLeaks leaks, 
um, are you know almost old news now. But um, having a leaker in your organisation, um, a whistleblower indeed, um, can cause you certain uh, certain issues, which can have a huge impact to to your brand, um, to your business, and ultimately to your financial status. Here's George. I said he'd be here. So George Michael is careless. His guilty feet got no rhythm. Um, a lot of insiders do fall within this bucket, and we saw that great pie chart early on. Uh, this has been a huge problem throughout the pandemic, where people have been at home, distracted, the dogs climbing on them, the kids are climbing on them. We've all been there, um, and you're not within that environment of the office where you think or you kind of think in a different way. And to counter that you know the the adversaries they've been all over this i think in the first quarter when we went into lockdown way back two years ago um the the top 10 phishing email topics nine out of ten were related to working from home in some format so they were really going after these careless people distracted folks the non-intentional insider uh, so that they would uh, they would click on these links the tenth one by the way was to do with valentine's day which is always the case in q1 um, but yeah, you could call them reckless, you could say they're negligent, negligent. you could say they're careless, um, but they've opened up a door in some way or another um, to allow an adversary in. And then we have these folks, our winning imposters. Everybody has a bad day sometimes. But um, what causes your disgruntled employees could be a number of things. So it could be um, they've been denied a promotion, they think they're not earning enough money, um someone's coming above them they don't want their new boss there could be a ton of things some of which are outside of your control so it could it could be a work event it could also be something's happened in their life or a combination of things that have finally pushed them into the fact that they've had enough um, and they are then going to to cause willful damage to your organization and then we've got these folks which is the curiosity killed cat this is still my favorite slide i think ever um, so people who were curious didn't set out to be an insider, but they found something interesting. Uh, we used to talk about this as finding a USB stick in a drawer somewhere. Maybe there's some payroll information on there, or indeed, you know, clicking around in, in one of the many storage areas we've got now in the cloud and finding something that isn't for them, that wasn't properly locked down. Um, and their reaction to that then has turned them into an insider. So we've talked about these previously um, at the Insider Risk Summit. Um, for those of you who lived through <laughs> my straight slides from that, thank you for making it through again. We've now got a new breed, though, and these are insiders who are on the payroll um, for a second company. So Lapsus have been have made the news a lot recently. Um, allegedly, a small group of teenagers here in my home country, some of which have been arrested. Um, that hasn't stopped them, though. They've then got, since the arrest, they've still gone on to to put more information into their uh, the telegram group and they are have been actively been hiring people to come and be insiders um, and they pay pretty well now you know some of you on on the call here may earn twenty thousand dollars a week i don't know but certainly in some of the countries they've been hiring people that is a huge amount of money so they've breached some very big tech companies um, and they've they've done that using the mo of just paying their way in giving somebody a good amount of money for access and then getting on with it using those awesome credentials to be able to move around. Uh, and when we look at these things always, it's credentials that are at the bottom of the you know, bottom of the cause. They are the keys to your castle. Um, they are also, I think, the top, um, top type of pwned data according to the Verizon Data Breach Report. So got to be able to monitor your, your credentials. Um, and ensure that you've got good policies and good processes and good technology in place to be able to keep them safe. So, um, Lapsus, I don't think will be the only type of uh, hacking group that will go ahead with that kind of same MO. I think now we've seen it, they've, they've seen that it works. There will be more copycats. This isn't going to go away. So, how do we measure? So, technology is always part of what we do for insider risk, um, it's not everything that we do. Uh, and Joseph had it at the bottom on his slide, and I absolutely agree. Um, first of all, we've got to start with some questions. We need to understand what we've got, um, who we've got, and not just employees, but contractors, third parties, that trusted relationship that you have. Um, like certainly with the, one of the more recent breaches with Lapsus, it wasn't, they didn't get a, an employee of that company. 
they got hold of someone who had access through some systems that were providing a service to them. So you need to be able to look at the whole pattern. It's not just about who have we physically employed, it's who do we, who do we give access to our stuff. Policies are really important. You can write stuff down all day, but if you don't measure adherence to those policies, all you've got is a piece of paper or indeed a Word document, and that alone will not protect you. You need to be able to control that, that those policies, and you need to be able to measure adherence um, and understand if people can get around them. So, uh, you know, the good old pen tests have come a long way. There are lots of automated tools you can use. Um, there are other ways of testing your employees without making you think them think that you don't trust them. Um, I've seen some great examples of like, the good old phishing tests, and I've seen some horrible ones. So um, ensuring that people are actually following your policies and your processes is really, really important. And measuring the success, the success of that is vital to the, success, the words, success of your insider risk program. Um, physical, how do we control access to stuff? Um, do you know, is everything wide open? I hope not. I think if anything's good to come, has come from the pandemic because we've opened up to the cloud, security and IT have been better at partnering. Um, and ensuring that when new systems, new applications are being spun up, actually that access isn't just a, oh, we'll just set up our own accounts and we don't talk to security around that, but actually it's brought in through some sort of access management tool. Um, the risk assessment is done and you can actually see how you're controlling access to the application and the data within. Can you spot abnormal and risky behaviours? Uh, there are multiple tools available that will that work along the lines of risk the important piece i think i think here is joseph mentioned normal this is really key our behaviors as, as humans change an awful lot two years ago now I, I personally worked from home anyway but then lived in an airport but so my, i would pop up in various countries all over the place now this isn't just the superman idea of impossible travel sam's in london right now sam appears in new york in 10 minutes that does look dodgy, um, but that alone is an interesting piece of information. You need to be looking at um, more than just where do I appear in the world, but what am I accessing? What's normal for me? What's normal for my group? What's normal for the organization? Um, and to have, to, if you have that, then you can have more confidence in spotting those abnormal or risky behaviors. And this one's really vital, is how quickly can you respond? Now, uh, if we look at breaches as a whole, uh, a bad example of response time, we could point fingers, which is probably a bit harsh, but true nonetheless. Um, Cathay were breached, took them four years to find out. Uh, bearing in mind this is already happening you know, inside your environment, um, network's definitely the wrong word these days, that um, being able to respond to that quickly is important. Your response though may, be, may vary depending on the type of incident that happens. Um, in some cases, you may actually want to let it run for a while and see what's going on so you can gather evidence. In other cases, you might want to shut that down very quickly. Um, there's a whole, this could be a whole other talk around playbooks and types of types of uh, breaches or activities that you see. Um, but response times and then um, how you resolve that, these are metrics that you know we have in place generally for security. Um, but how quickly can you find something in the first place? It sounds easy when you say it, but we're all drowning under a sea of data right now. So having the right tools to be able to spot that is really important. We love counting beans in cybersecurity. We do, we've had these many malwares, we've had these many phishings, we've had these many blah, blah, blahs. Um, it is an interesting data point, it's not enough. Um, especially those of you, if you've ever had to go and explain to outside of your role what you do, if you just show someone a count of, of how many of whatever it is that we've had, um, that it does raise an eyebrow because what are you doing about it? That's the, that's the most important thing. Um, we've got all this data. We talked about that just a second ago. Machine learning is your friend. Now you can build your own. There are some great ones on the market. Being able to use automated detection as part of this, um, the technology stack in this is, is vital to be able to find those needles in a haystack full of needles and hay and stacks. Um, we need to automate to be able to do this. And for those tools that have risk scoring algorithms included, um, of which there are many, um, A, they should be able to work out of the box and be able to find risky behaviours in your organisation um, once they've normalised. 
but um, there, there are, can be additional factors. So you may need to adjust those risk scoring algorithms for things that are very specific to your business. You know, security vendors are very good at, at creating tools that will help you. What they don't know about is your individual business. So as you're deploying these types of tools, very important that you can then make, make small changes easily without breaking things um, to be able to make that work for risk that applies to you. All right, data sorters, data sorters, very, very important. Um, we used to with SIM throw everything in and see what happens. Uh, it's not a great way to do it. It costs you a lot of money to do it that way. But ultimately, you can't fight what you can't see. So if you're embarking on an insider risk program, you need to make sure, and this sounds very basic, but people miss this, the data sources that are going in actually do align to insider risk. Um, we've got a great data sheet I can share on this after the event, but um, if you've got gaps um, in what you can see, we're very good at looking at the, at the, at the perimeter or indeed um, the endpoint. but if there are gaps there where someone can move laterally through the network, um, you're not gonna be able to support this program very, very well. Um, I've already waxed lyrical about abnormal behavior and indeed the, the importance of, of normal behavior because you get that confidence that what you, when something says it's abnormal, um, you can see, okay, well, Sam normally does this, but actually now she's doing this, this is worrying to me. Um, false positives have been the bane of the security industry since the security industry. Okay, so te technology is part of this, but it's certainly not everything. Um, the X factor to this, and I do hope you, you love the Simon Cowell-esque picture, the man has a very, very strange pair of trousers. So it all comes down to people and starting with employee satisfaction. Uh, we all, I think most organisations have some sort of employee satisfaction survey, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. I would recommend partnering with HR on the types of questions because I mean, I've done, I don't know how many of these in my career. And sometimes you go through it and you think, ah, oh, this is kind of worded in a way that you're going to make everything sound great. So weaving questions into employee satisfaction surveys, regular check-ins. It doesn't have to be a giant survey that's sent out every week. Um, you can even like do like a, a net promoter score type question you know, every month. Uh, that's the internal side of it. The external side of it. Um, we had a guest recently on our um, new CISO podcast, uh, George Finney, who's written a really good book, actually, people are asking questions about measuring um, security awareness. Great book. Um, again, I'll chuck a link in the chat afterwards. And he's found there is a huge correlation between um, low scores on Glassdoor and organisations who've seen data breaches. So this absolutely matters, both from an insider risk perspective um, but also in an overall breaches, if you've got somebody coming you know, from, a, from a hacking group, at some point they will be an insider because they've got inside to your network. Um, employee satisfaction has a huge overreaching effect on whether or not your employees will care about protecting your stuff or not, but also whether or not they're likely to be um, lured away by a group like Lapsus, um, or indeed you know, they might go and leak stuff themselves. Benefits also matter. Um, you know, our, we're all living in a world now, I think, where we don't, we don't just turn up purely for money. Employee benefits absolutely have an impact as far as uh, employee satisfaction, whether or not someone's going to be loyal to your company, um, and whether or not, again, they could be a risk to your insider risk program. Um, and, you know, loyalty is, is challenging right now. We've all been stuck in, in the house for the best part of two years, or most of us have, and we've lost a lot of control over our lives. People are moving jobs. It's been the one piece of control that we've had. So this isn't just a case of saying, well, wait a minute, Abby, why have you just suddenly turned up in a shirt, tie and a jacket to our meeting? And oh, look, your next meeting is a private appointment. Um, this isn't even a survey question. This really comes down to good people management um, and not treating people like crap is very, very important. So um, you, can, you can look at loyalty in a couple of ways. Yes, you can measure it using employee type surveys, but also think about the overall empl employee experience that you give. Um, if you know, people are more likely to stay and less likely to be cross with you and therefore cause a problem if you're looking after them. 
Um, and recognition goes a long way. So um, most of us, are, well, depends where you are. The country I'm in right now, um, inflation is great. It's not in line with pay rises. So um, you've got to look at how do you reward employees? It's not just a case of, here's your pay rise, thanks for coming. Um, that ongoing recognition is different for everybody. It comes back again to not, not treating people like crap. And what's going on in their lives? You know, if you're a people manager uh, and you're, you know, you're, you're ultimately, I wouldn't say parents of your employees, but you're involved in their lives, if you don't treat them as a human being and you don't actually have an idea what's going on in their lives, um, you might either be the, the thing that flips them over um, into the, the falling down situation unintentionally, but making sure that you know your employees, who they are, what they need and what's happening with them, um, all, you know, all can stand you in good stead. I'll leave time. All right, I'm nearly up against time. I'll go quick. So bring it all together. Um, any 80s music fans? Uh, on here right now. I hope you've got an earworm. So insider risk is a people sport for sure. Um, if you're assembling an insider risk program, you need people from across the business and you need to be looking at your metrics as a team to be able to understand what's happening and why it's happening. Um, very, very important. This shouldn't just be owned by the cybersecurity team. This has to go across the business, HR, legal, um, business owners, as well as cybersecurity and IT. When you're calculating risk, there's a couple of easy kind of ways people look at their risk around probability and loss, um, probability and impact. You can start with a very you know, good standard, you know, you can do it in Excel, but you've got these additional factors that need to be considered as you're calculating that risk um, when you're looking at people. Um, measuring your program gap gaps, there are some beans we can count. Um, so looking at how, how many insider incidents we've had, and what does that mean? So this isn't just a case of counting. Uh, we need to ask why this is happening and understanding where the gaps are so that we can do something about them. So incidents that have reflected gaps in prevention, it, it, insider incidents that have re reflected gaps in detection, um, and any issues you've had around response. So this can come back to people, this can come back to technology, this can come back to process, um, but you always need to be improving on any, any type of program you have in cybersecurity. If you're not looking at those gaps, you're never going to get better. So it's important this is a, a, a cyclic process that you continue going around and continue improving at. You might not get it right straight off the bat. Keep asking why. Um, I've done a lot of root cause analysis over my years. Um, I like the five wise process a lot. If you're not aware of it, again, I can pop a link into the chat. Uh, asking why repeatedly, or five, it, sh it should, when you've done five of them and you don't feel like you're sounding like a, a five-year-old child with a question and the same question and the same question and the same question um will should help you get to the bottom of what's really happening what's happening on the surface when you're um you're investigating and you're trying to find out the gaps and how to improve um five wise will stand you in good stead nearly that okay some light reading for you two things um please do uh, grab this wonderful 74 page document, um, read it at your leisure, maybe to the kids at bedtime. Um, and if you're interested in more in this, um, the glass door stat that I mentioned, really great article from George Finney, I'd recommend you have a look at, that talks about culture um, and, and completely is relevant to what we're talking about today. So to that end, um, no questions now, but I'll be on the panel. Thank you very much for coming to this um, and I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you very much, Sam. Insightful, fun as always. Uh, Star Wars falling down and George Michael. I think you've encapsulated insider risk management uh, as well as anybody. So thank you for the thank you for the comparisons. Uh, but on a more on a more serious note, I think your point about data sources and SIM is is very well taken. Um, I think that's an important uh, that's an important point. Um, and also, I, I, I personally found it very intriguing, uh, the correlation between Glassdoor reviews and data breaches. So very, very interesting. There have been some questions coming in, but again, we're going to reserve those. So I am, before I turn things over to Claire, I am going to have a little bit of fun. Okay, so you've used your movie analogies, and it's only fair as I turn things over to Claire, who has the the very interesting task of explaining how do you communicate metrics to senior executives right 
this is always something that comes to my mind, right? It's Rush Hour, one of my favorite movies, and it's Jackie Chan and, 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 and Chris Tucker basically involved in this constant dialogue, right? Which is, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? And I feel like this is very reflective of security, um, you know, practitioners and what they're trying to communicate over to leadership. But, you know, this is just my stab at, uh, at an analogy, if you will. Uh, let me provide a quick introduction of Clea. She is um, a senior risk advisor with Code42. She's been in the IT space for the last 10 years. She's worked in application security. Uh, until most recently, she's taken the role of developing um, insider threat programs as well. She works with many of our clients, will no doubt bring a lot of um, insights and, and some of those conversations into the mix. Clea, the uh, fl uh, floor is. All right, awesome. Well, um, okay, it's 1230 my time. You all have <laughs> been here a long time, so I appreciate you sticking with us. Um, I am going to flip this a little bit on its head for the topic. Yes, we are going to talk about communication between executives and um, the analysts on, on the ground who have to you know, determine what's happening. Um, but I'm going to look at this more as how can we align what's happening in the business to what we need to focus now on in the minute, in the moment. All right, it's not a Zoom if we don't have slides. So let's rock. Um, Abit gave me a nice little intro, um, uh, fun fact about me, which is always so hard to you know, choose what you wanna share publicly. Um, but I am an, an avid reader. I usually have about eight books, either going reading or listening at one time if that gives you any insight into how my brain works, a lot of variety and um, changing. So um, kind of the theme of this, he who defends everything defends nothing. You can't just think that you're gonna get through all your alerts and you're going to have a successful insider risk or insider threat program. You have to try and uh, align that with the business. And this talk is a, an attempt to do that. Okay, so does this matter? Now, uh, you all are here for to talk about insider risk. So I assume that we're on the same page that yes, this matters. But if, if you need if you need a little additional um, stats, 38% uh, of the US's GDP comes from intellectual property intensive industries and IP theft costs upwards of $600 billion a year. So that's a lot of value and money to ignore. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think the reason why there's all of a sudden more of an interest in thinking about how do we protect this content, this IP that we've spent so much time uh, working to develop. So if you were to ask any executive what the most important piece of intellectual property is to protect um, in, their, in their environment or at the company, the likelihood is it's theirs is going to be top of top of the, the heap. Um, you know, people just assume that they are the most important thing and what they're working on is the most important. Um, but we all know it depends. So it depends on uh, the business life cycle. It depends on what's happening with the employees. It depends on what the, the marching orders of the company are and at what time. So um, reality, the value of intellectual property changes on the events that are happening on, in the environment. So just like we use world events and critical vulnerabilities to help shape our risk-based approach to external threats, so should we try and do the same internal. And uh, this image is, is an attempt to uh, remind us that once upon a time, uh, humans were so had such hubris that we believed that the sun revolved around us because it could be no other way, just like executives tend to think that they're the most important thing when we all know that there's plenty of other external factors. Okay, um, this is a, a kind of fun fun mind game. I think I remember it from a psychology class, but um, one of my colleagues uses this in some of her work with um, customers building out insider risk programs and her, her clients. Um, so 
risk is a great, great example how risk looks different depending on your perspective. So you can see a duck, a rabbit, an old lady, a young lady, uh, and, and all of this is to say, you're, you're correct. You know, there is a duck right there. There's a rabbit, there's old lady, there's a young lady. Um, but, but these same images are, are dependent on our perception and bias. So that's the same way you can kind of think about how do you uh, prioritize the, the insider risks in your environment or what you're trying to protect. Um, and it's important to, sh to share that vision of insider risk within your organization um, so that you can begin to prioritize it. So perhaps, you know, Q1, we need to focus on protecting the rabbit because that's going to determine our sales and our profitability for the rest of the, the year. Um, but the second half of the year, let's focus on uh, uh, working with the old lady because she's going to um, help our employee team uh, minimize burnout. Um, the, the point is you need to have a shared vision um, and an understanding of you know, what, what are we trying to see um, and, and where can we start to focus some efforts. And this is an attempt not only to, to minimize um, uh, burnout and alert fatigue, but also be more effective at all of the information that we're, we're um, trying to interpret at once. Machine learning is great, yes, but insider risk is one of those areas, as many of you know, that there's so many intangible things that we need to, to think about and try and incorporate that you can't just rely on an alert or some sort of notification. Um, Sam talked about your colleague comes on with a, with a, um, a suit and tie and then a private meeting, like great example. We, we know people are leaving. We know these things are happening. You have to think outside of just the alerts and think about what cycles are happening and what might motivate somebody to either do something malicious or unintentional or just leave and take data with them when they change jobs. So let's get into what uh, employee and business life cycle risk mapping might look like. Um, the indicators and in the business life cycle and the employee life cycle, um, some of these I took some liberties with, but a lot of them will seem pretty familiar. To begin with, any uh, analyst or anyone who has to interpret the alerts that are happening probably will agree with some of these stats. Um, two and three security professionals don't know which insider risk to prioritize. And that's because that vision is not shared with them. So when it comes to insider risks, how are you supposed to know that I need to focus on um, these financial documents during this, this quiet period versus focusing on uh, you know, a patent that might be going out. Um, and to add to that, most IT security leaders think that the business should be responsible for protecting their own intellectual property. So we're clearly at a crossroads where we're pointing at each other and saying, this is your responsibility to protect. And in the end, you know, we're, we're flying somewhat dark. So, Throughout the employee life cycle, there are times when you can assume added risk or there are some stressors. And it's in these periods that we can help shape where we focus alerting. So let's explore the employee life cycle a bit. Okay, you're in onboarding. You join a new company, you're excited about making a good first impression, you bring in some work from your last organization, hey, you created it, it's yours. Um, for example, pricing and buying cycles from your customer base. And things are going well for a time. But then there was a lower than expected bonus. That's where we are in this little purple section in this employee life cycle experience. Um, and the stock price is dropping and you decide, you know what, it's time to start exploring options. Uh, you know, Code 42 has been a great place to work, but uh, I, I think it's time for me to uh, see what else is out there. So what do you do? The first thing you start to do is think about what would make you extra valuable in your next position. Um, 
And how do you do this? Well, you go through all of your old projects. You may start to begin downloading things. You may start to move documents or presentations or content that would help you give you a leg up in your next role or in your interviews. And you usually do this a few weeks before you put in your notice. So in a practical sense, if all of a sudden you get some alerts, you're an analyst, all of a sudden you get some alerts on, on an employee who is um, moving uh, tons of data to destinations that they've never used before. They're doing it on off hours. They may be um, uh, ac requesting access to things that they haven't traditionally had access to. All of these things are, are not necessarily threats to the organization yet, um, but they are higher risk behaviors that we should make you think, okay, what's going on with this person? Should we watch them? Should we just kind of keep an eye and see what's happening? Um, so you get the other job, um, very exciting. You put in your week, two weeks notice. Now that your notice is, is submitted, maybe you just turn in your laptop and that's the end. Now, if you are not thinking about the risk of departing employees posing the, that they pose to the organization, you, you know, that might be the end. And they take the, the data, they bring it to the next company, you know, your competitors have a leg up on you. However, if you think about where you can be proactive at monitoring what they've been doing for the last 30 days or 60 days, or think about how you can stop that data from being used in their next role, you're going to have a leg up. And all of a sudden you have more of a sense of control of what's happening. Um, from an insider perspective. And there's been a lot of questions around metrics. I think this is a great, great metric to use. How many new employees are downloading um, previous company's data? Look at that. So monitor, you know, set up some, some visibility for the first 30 days, 60 days. Um, and then of your departing employees, how many are taking data? Probably most. And how many are taking data that is sensitive intellectual property that you have to then collect? Um, so these are two kind of easy wins um, because you know the, the breaking points of, of, of when there's change and you can start to monitor that. Now let's think about the business life cycle. Um, this one is a bit more complicated. Uh, every business is, is somewhat different. So we're using some liberties um, uh, when we're looking at this one. So if we're thinking about the business life cycle in relation to intellectual property, as I mentioned in the start of the talk, the value of the, the data, that IP, can change in relation to what's occurring or has occurred in the business life cycle. Um, so I met with our CMO and I said, you know, people always say they want to protect marketing information or they care about, you know, um, uh, marketing, marketing content or messaging. What does that really mean? And she put this in perspective that I, I think is, is really interesting and applicable for anyone who's trying to determine, you know, is this just something that can be shared publicly or is this something that we need to keep closer to us? Um, and uh, assuming that you don't have those communications or you're, you're in the process of developing those relationships. Um, so for example, uh, let's think about the release of a new product which might be in this orange section, the value creation phase. So that's your market research, your R&D, um, which both of those things are incredibly expensive to develop, um, but they're not as valuable after a product is in the market. So if your analysts know that there is a new project underway, that's going to revolutionize how people interact with information. Um, we can say the iWatch circa 2015, uh, how can your business, you as a business leader, give them that information to prioritize events and behaviors? Um, so the iWatch changed how, hello, I'm wearing one and addicted, changed how we, we get messages and changed how we um, tell time and the information that we want at, on our, our wrist. Um, it's so incredibly sensitive that got out prior to Apple's release. However, 
an updated watch band, not, not quite as valuable. That's still a product release, but it's not shut down the doors. We have a mole type of, type of release. Um, now moving along the business life cycle, uh, let's think about sales information. That's another one I get all the time. I need to protect our sales information and uh, customer lists. Okay, well, let's define that a little bit more. Uh, a list of potential buyers who are engaging with your content. So that was, those are the people who, you know, maybe they joined this call and they're starting to think about an insider risk program and they have budget, but they don't really know where to begin. And, you know, they're, they're thinking about things. That type, of, that type of person is way more valuable to a sales organization than somebody who is uh, public on, our, on, a, on your website saying, I'm already a customer um, because that's public. So when you think about looking at how people are um, moving data, how they're interacting with it, where they're sending it, um, there's a higher cost associated with those who are not yet your customers. And that's what you would want to focus efforts around protecting. Um, so as analysts, if you see a, a salesperson emailing themselves com the company's target prospects and it's a higher piece of value information than the, the customers that are on the website. Um, and, I and I think these are elements that, you know, we, we know we need to protect these things, but when there's only so much time in the day and bandwidth and ability to prioritize, thinking about, you know, what are the big product releases that we need to think about? What are the big um, events happening in the business that we want to be partners with? Again, there's always conversations. How do I level this up to the executives? Well, here's a great way. What are, what are your big projects this year? What, where are you uh, focusing? What tools are you using that you want to have us continue to look at? Um, you know, what, what teams are you going to be interacting with? Are there any things that you would be, would be a showstopper if this got out? How can we start to build controls, both technical and education wise, that, that will help you um, uh, eliminate that risk or at least reduce it? And then, you know, an easy one, financials. Of course, there's compliance and regulations that we, we need to think about. But we also need to think about, um, you know, when is that financial information most valuable or most critical to protect? Those would be the whiteout periods. Um, and then what's in them? You know, is it the earnings reports, stock options, et cetera? Um, let's, let's have a period annually where we know we're going to focus on not letting that information out. Um, a great uh, insider risk story was public, so we'll, we'll name the guilty, was a Palo Alto case. So there was uh, an analyst or an engineer at the, at the organization who was able to get access to the earnings reports. And he did this for many, many years. And he would get that, that report, he would download it, and then he would share it with all his friends. And they were able to uh, trade based on that information, make a lot of money. Um, and it wasn't until this person was trying to flee the country that they discovered that their controls were not um, being successful. This was many years ago. So I think all, all guilty parties have, have closed those holes, but it's a great example of, you, you know, how somebody, an insider who has no right or reason to be touching uh, financial documents, has access to them, is interacting with them, um, and then leveraging them for financial gain. This is a hypothetical, but, but what if you could do this for um, events that are happening in your environment? We know August 5th, we are going to be having a reorg and a downsize. Um, or, or maybe end of end of Q2. So July 31st, we're announcing <clears throat> a reorg and a downsize. So we expect a spike in exfiltration events during this period. What if the analysts had that, that information and they could apply that? Or we have a new product release happening here. We, we expect um, if we see any spikes related to this, let's focus on um, source code and, and product related things. Same with a financial report, 
annually. We know that this happens around you know, early September. Let's start putting some additional visibility into this. Um, all of a sudden, you're, you're able to take all this information that you're being thrown at and able to condense it. Um, two, other, two other points, and then we'll wrap. Um, quiet periods. You know, this is a this is a pretty easy one to focus on, um, even if you don't have that relationship with your your financial wing of your organization. You know that there are some periods where they need to lock down that information, especially if you're publicly traded. Um, apply that to how you're you're analyzing um, the alerts and the information that you're you're getting. Um, same thing with um, source code. People always say, "I want to protect my source code." Well, let's dig a little bit deeper to that. What about patents related to source code? You only have 30 days after a release to protect that information before somebody else can add um, additional elements to a patent. So that period is so critical that that information is protected. If you, if you know that your organization applies for a lot of patents, work with that team to be aware of when those release periods are, um, and, and then who and how people should be interacting with the data. Okay, in conclusion, let's work with the business heads to understand the cyclical nature of their programs. Um, even though everyone thinks they're the most important thing in the room, it depends on what's happening and uh, where the organization wants to uh, focus efforts. Um, again, understand what the company values most and when. Um, I don't know if anyone ever reads their own 10Ks or their own um, public releases on, on product strategy, but if your business isn't talking to you, that might be a great place for you to uh, interpret your own information. Um, and finally, uh, communicate and prioritize based on the business risk scenarios and build those out, sort of like threat modeling for what matters when and how do we respond to it. Great, we got some Q and A. Um, I have some sources in here that I pulled from, um, and you know, happy to chat on LinkedIn or Twitter or any of the millions of ways we communicate these days. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Claire. That's that's awesome. I, I particularly like the the usage the the usage of like a timeline, right? I think that's the one thing that's that's very interesting about insider risk management is. When, when are those heightened moments of risk, right? Is it during a, a merger acquisition? Is it during you know, a new product? And I think your, your example of Apple, I mean, you, you talk about a company that has to be paranoid all the time, right? Like w w you have users like us that are just antsy for that next iPhone. Just imagine what they have to deal with on the inside, right? And what that IP might be in the hands of somebody else. So fantastic in insights, fantastic examples. Um, and we have some questions as well. So I'd like to ask Brandon, Sam, JB, if you could come off, uh, uh, um, you know, hiding in the background and, 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 and be live. We're going to have a fun discussion now. Um, I think our, our audience has been subjected to their weekly dose of slides. So now we'll actually turn things over to, uh, to actually having uh, some dialogue. So um, I'm going to pick uh, on each of you that I think some questions that are more pertinent to specific areas that you presented on. JB, let me start with you, you know, because during your session, you talked a little, uh, you know, at length about culture, building culture. How do security leaders influence that culture? Well, I think the first thing is we get to get outside our own comfort zones and go talk to people uh, that are not in security. Uh, that may mean making friends with uh, with the HR principal, right? The chief people officer, uh, and then you know talking about the need uh, for culture to be an as or security rather to be an aspect of what we're doing culturally in, in terms of our employee experience. Uh, it kind of includes um, you know evaluating things like the uh, security and awareness training that we may have in place now in saying, you know, how do we make this where it's more, A, more appealing, uh, where people don't groan uh, when those emails come out, <clears throat> or is more focused on changing how we perceive security and our role in the company uh, as data stewards, uh, as opposed to memorizing a bunch of nonsense uh, about compliance regulations that uh, is not directly applicable to everyone in their day-to-day -day lives. 
I'm going to add one thing to that. Um, think about all your dumb end users. I always like to point to myself as an example, right? Why, why do I care, I need to care about protecting data? I mean, it's your data. What, I'm not going to pay the fine. What, what does it matter to me? So put in a perspective that your users are going to give a damn, right? For example, um, I want to use all these different SaaS tools and I want to work with this vendor and I want to share information this way. And I, you know, I like to communicate here. If you're going to block me and say, no, you can't do that, I'm still going to do it. But if you tell me why I can't do it and then give me the tools and the ability to do it, I'm going to be a lot more cooperative with you. So I always use the analogy or visual. If you think about bumpers on a, on a bowling alley, you can do whatever you want. You can get that ball down however you want. But if you have the bumpers in there, i.e. the security team can put some protection on, you're going to be safe. So put in, a, put in perspective of how the um, employees are going to want to interact and, and why you're doing this, not just big brother watching or you know, hard rules. Yeah, it's, a, it's a really interesting point because I, I do think transparency goes a long way just in terms of communicating to end users what is being collected, why it's being collected, for what bigger purpose. My, my hope is that everybody is on the same page with protecting an organization's assets because an organization's growth is correlated to your personal growth. So I think precisely to your point, right, putting it in terms that everybody can understand that everybody is actually a team member versus like a, you know, a team destroyer essentially, I think is well taken. Um, Brandon, this next question is for you. What are some examples of potential risk indicators that can help you when identifying insider risk? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, there's multiple different categories that we can look at for different type of types of potential risk indicators. If that person um, has some type of, uh, issue with human human resources, right? If they're uh, on reprimand, if they're, you know, potentially uh, subject to a demotion or if they're receiving poor performance ratings, then they could be at a higher risk to conduct some type of activity that would be uh, malicious. If they're um, going through some type of financial trouble or difficulty, uh, if they're going, you know, a victim of, a, or if they're, you know, going through some type of garnishment activity, going through some type of, you know, personal life crisis or other issue like that, that could make them more prone to something that could cause uh, harm to the organization. Um, also, if they have some type of, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> drug use issue or um, issue with criminal history or violence uh, that could also make them more prone to some type of activity that could be potentially an insider risk or concern. Interesting, you know, and, and moving over to, to you, Sam. So I do not make $20,000 a week. That would be nice. But reality is here, here we are. Um, insiders on the payroll. That's a very interesting one, mm -hmm. especially at that type of payroll. What do you do to dissuade those individuals? Can you dissuade them? Like, where, where do you think, uh, because this isn't going to stop, right? The amounts are only going to grow. But how do, you, how do you set in motion as an organization, you know, the right culture, the right steps to dissuade someone from ever even thinking about that? It's tough, right? And I think it's, it's, we've seen with some of the countries where they've done this, like twenty thousand dollars a week is like that's a huge. I mean, it's a huge amount of money anyway. But you know, add in, depending on where you live, that could be you know your year's salary in a week, in a week, and like that that puts things in perspective a little bit. Um, dissuading employees from doing that, I think, is difficult. Yes, there's the culture aspect to this, one hundred percent, and you want people to love the organisation they work for. Um, but when it comes down to life changing sums of money, um, I think at that point, it's you have to look at it from a different angle. You've got to look at, you know, are you monitoring for different behaviours? Um, are things locked down tight enough? Anytime you bring on, I mean, in the case when it was a third party, really doing that due diligence and making sure that they have the bumpers around them to be able to stop them from, you know, to, to accessing stuff. So if someone does come along and say, hey, do you want a year's salary? Just drop me your details. Um, that those details will be worth less to the person who's trying to pay them for them. Fantastic. Uh, JB, Brandon, Claire, uh, anyone want to weigh in on that one? 
Yeah, I know it's a tough one, which is why I'm, I, you know, it's, it's a tough one to, to answer definitely in the few minutes that we, we do have. But if you, if you do want to come back to it, feel free. Clea, I'm going to turn things over to you. Uh, this question, how can I leverage insight into what's happening in the business if I don't have relationships with stakeholders? Um, okay, great question. Uh, first off, use what you do know. So I first thing I pointed to was um, new employees or people leaving. There's That's a great place to start. Um, the second second area I would look, if maybe you don't even have a relationship with HR or that communication, second area I would look is um, what happens, what's public knowledge? You know there's going to be a bonus period. Um, you know that bonus is going to be good or bad. You're, maybe if you're a public company, your, your stocks are doing really well, so you assume people are happier. Um, right now, that's not the case for, for most organizations, so you can assume that people are, are going to be start looking other places. Um, so use those external factors to help shape and, and give you some wins. Um, and, and then, you know, maybe flip it on the side rather than saying to um, a stakeholder, you know, what do you want to protect? Why don't you show them what's leaving and ask them if that matters to you? So, hey, um, your uh, customer report just left. Um, it went to somebody's personal email and it looks like they're leaving the company. Does that matter to you? All of a sudden it's like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's have some communication. So that's where I would start. Fantastic. Thank you. Great insights. JB, this one, <laughs> excuse me, is for you. Uh, where does the insider risk team belong in the organization? I'm, I'm very curious about this one myself, but yes, I think that's always a, a tricky one. It's a tr it's a tricky one because typically, you know, if we're thinking about insider risk or we call it insider threat, right? There's sort of a um, preference to put that or make it the responsibility of the security leader or you know, make it the CISO's problem. CISO kind of looks around and says, "I don't really have a don't really have a place for this. It should just be it should be in the SOC, right? We'll just put it in the SOC, right? So do you put it broadly in the SOC?" And I give everybody access to look at, to monitor employees and sort of investigations. Uh, you know, I can go into it probably a thousand and one, maybe a thousand and two reasons why that's an awful idea. Don't have time for that today. So first of all, I'll say, start off with where it doesn't belong. It does not belong in your sock. Or if it is in your sock, it is a uh, one, maybe two or three people that you pull aside and say, this is your area of responsibility or your area of focus. Uh, and you separate that from sort of the large population in the SOC. You know, ideally, this is actually not sitting in your security operations center. It actually may roll up to something like uh, you know, HR and be external to security, or it could be part of the, uh, part of the general counsel's organization. And why is all this important, right? A little, little bit of separation of duties. And also to remember that the focus is on people and not the machines that they're operating. You know, this is a people problem and not necessarily a, a pure tech problem. That's, re that's really interesting insights. And I, it's interesting in some of my, you know, moments with CISOs and, 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 and just in general with the community, I think everybody is in that state of who owns the risk problem, who owns the insider risk problem. Um, and generally, I think generally there's an understanding that somebody has to own it, somebody has to assume it, but nobody is essentially putting their hands up first is kind of the impression I'm getting right now. Um, let's go uh, to you, Brandon, on this next question. This is an interesting one. What are some best practices for prioritizing training, type, scope, depth when you're rolling out um, inside of risk training and awareness? That's an interesting one because you know you, I think we tend to bulk deliver training, but the idea of prioritizing that training is very interesting. So I'd love your insights on that one. Yeah, so I'd say you know you definitely want to establish uh, you know a base uh, inside of risk training program and uh, capability to get out to you know, all the stakeholders and uh, personnel within the environment of an organization, you know, but you want to establish uh, specialized training for people with uh, elevated privileges or specialized functions, uh, people that may have a greater level of risk due to their status within the organization to allow them to understand, you know, how that impacts the potential risk that they may have, not necessarily um, <clears throat> them themselves as a malicious person, but the target that they are, uh, that, you know, basically they have on their back because of being in the role that they're in. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, and I think, uh, I think kind of going back to organizations really thinking about uh, this idea of what point in time means to them, right? I think we all, uh, I can, you know, I think everybody is, is gonna is gonna totally relate to this, right? We've all been subjected to that training moment, whether it's once a quarter or not. And we got to sit through these modules and we pass them, um, in my case, barely, but we pass them and we're subjected to like these videos that are just terrible, not in context, and we're now expected to make the right decisions, right? So I think your point that the idea of point in time or this, those nudge moments are very important. Um, Sam, next question for you. Uh, this is, uh, you know, and I, I'm not surprised because of course the analogies with Star Wars, George Michael, uh, you know, had to come into the mix at some point. But I think one of the things that you did very well is you, you kind of, I don't want to say you blurred the lines, but you 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 kind of put insider threat and insider risk in the same realm, right? You have deliberate, malicious, but then you have non-malicious, careless users. Yeah. Um, when when you when you think about monitoring, um, understanding that you have malicious and non-malicious in the mix, how, how do you go about doing that, right? Because I, I feel like. It, it might be one or the other. Are you, are you pointing your solution at just watching the malicious activity or can you set it up in a way where you can essentially look for both from a risk perspective? But just curious for your thoughts. I think, I mean, I'm talking about what we do with XV, but certainly I think you can do both. I think he's looking at that and how that data is cut. And to JB's point earlier about, I, I fully agree, insider risk should not sit in the sock. Um, this is where, again, I think the value of having that normal behavior data is so huge because you know, if somebody gets hold of my credentials and it's being investigated to look like I'm a malicious insider, um, do I want to be like on the hook for that? Or it, do you need to be able to very simply pull out like, OK, Sam isn't in Hong Kong all of a sudden on a completely different ISP using a Mac because she's too childish to be able to use one? Um, or, or whatever it might be, and all of a sudden she's poking at the wrong servers. I, I'd rather not be hauled in front of um, you know legal teams and everybody else for, for something that I haven't done. Um, so you need to be able to see granularly like what is normal, what's abnormal, um, to be able to figure out whether or not it is malicious um, or, or a, a George Michael circumstance. Um, and you can't just do that with alerts alone. Does anybody else want to chime in on that before we, we get to our next question? Um, I, I mean, I'm going to emphasize in, insider risk is, it, I think one of the reasons why it's so challenging is it's not black and white, right? Like people are, people are doing stupid things, but they're also trying to get their job done. And, you know, and then, then, at, then at the same time, like at what point does it turn from, I was just doing my job to now this is malicious, right? I may email myself, all of my brilliant PowerPoints um, to do my job while I'm there. But now all of a sudden, if I'm leaving, is that a risk to the business? Um, you know, and then to what level, to what extent do you want to pursue it? I mean, there's so many gray areas. It's not just an analyst or, you know, somebody in the SOC who can just close out an alert. You have to pull in these other stakeholders to make these decisions of like, at what point are we comfortable escalating? Is this a breach? Do we have to make it public? Can we just keep it amongst ourselves? Um, you know, and, and I think that's why summits like these are so important to to mind meld. What are you doing? What's working? Uh, you know, and so on. Yeah, and and speaking of dialogue, right? I, I, this next question is for you, Clea, and then we're going to actually open it up a little bit because there have been some other questions uh, as well that have that have been trickling in. Um, how do you start to have dialogues with with business leaders about insider risk? Um, well, I think the, the first thing is to make them aware of the problem um, and pull them in as part of the solution, right? Like, I don't know what, what you really want to protect, or I don't know how you want to respond. Um, I don't know how we should roll this out in a way that is going to align with our company culture and not become, um, you know, fear mongering. And in a way that, um, you know, when something does happen, how can we respond with, uh, we call it empathetic and in, in an empathetic way um, so that you're not just assuming the worst of your peers and your employees and your teams. Um, and that's a dialogue that has to happen, uh, you know, across the, across teams. It's not just security. I always tell people, 
security, you're going to find something that's great. You package it up and then who are you passing it to? Is it going to HR, the manager or legal? Some, you know, for example, who's going to actually have that next level of conversation? Some great points. Another question, and this is actually for all, <laughs> excuse me, for all of you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pinpoint anyone because I think this, this is broad. What would you test as part of an insider risk pen test? I told you it was an interesting question. That's a great, it's a great question, right? And it's you know, something you typically see is some uh, more advanced red teaming types of exercises. Uh, you know, probably the first one, I think uh, I, one of the other speakers mentioned this, right? Um, is what can I get from the user? You know, how much cooperation can I get from an insider? Can I get them to give me their credentials? You know, uh, this is you know, kind of typically, you know, hey, this is uh, the IT group. Uh, can you give me your username and password? I have to do an account reset because if I get it now, I've got now I am I am the insider. Uh, you know, another piece of that could be uh, giving the red teamer. Um, you know, real credentials and seeing how long it takes the insider threat team or the SOC to recognize the behaviors uh, or doing things that, uh, you know, you know, may look like, you know, good baseline behaviors and then see how quickly they're able to, you know, come back and identify. Uh, I think there's a lot of really, really, if you're, if you're a red teamer, right, a lot of fun things uh, to be measured here as part of that assessment. Brandon, I think you were going to chime in. I just want to make sure uh, that you had you had a chance to respond as well. Yeah, I was going to actually, you know, <clears throat> say some num a number of things that Joseph said as well. But uh, you know, I guess you know other things that you can do is just to make sure that uh, they um, employees and stakeholders within the environment understand risks of you know, you know different uh, things being introduced into the environment would be you know drop like a USB thumb drive and see if somebody you know picks it up and puts it in their computer uh, to you know create some type of uh, um, event where uh, you know they were basically taken advantage of because of uh, you know more or less ignorance right Sam, Clea, anything you you want to add just yeah just to add to that and I, I agree fully like there is fun you can have with this if you're on the red team because that's what red team do they just go and have fun and break things and then have to write really big reports which is the bit that everyone misses um i think that's the physical pen test access to part of this is important too um, you know, we are vulnerable as humans to you know, open doors for people because they're carrying something heavy or um, my, my dear friend Jenny Radcliffe put a piece of paper up on a door that said, please don't leave this, uh, please leave this door open, signed facilities. People did. So, um, you know, to, for someone to get inside to your organisation, um, physically to then be an insider, if you walk around and see, you know, there's passwords on post-it notes and the rest of it, um, you can make it very, very easy for somebody nefarious to, to do damage. So it's, yeah, it's, again, it's the people side, um, the physical side, as well as process and technology. Awesome insights. All right, I, so this is, this is gonna be an interesting question and, and I wanna be careful in how we respond to this because one of the things that we will absolutely hold ourselves accountable for um, on these trailblazer calls is like, we're, we're never selling. This is, not a, this is not selling at all. However, with that being said, one of the questions is um, point taken that AI ML is not a silver bullet for insider risk. Can you recommend any tools out there that can reduce manual alert monitoring and add value? So again, let's let's not mention any vendor names, but are there any let, let's let's think of it as approaches, right? Are there any approaches that you could suggest processes that you can suggest uh, that might help answer that question? I guess I'll wait into this a, a bit since I'm, you know, kind of sort of the um, objective uh, contributor to this, I think, uh, at least I'll try to be. Um, I think typically what I've seen a lot of um, insider threat programs get started around would be something like user behavior monitoring, right? We're looking at like user behavior analytics, uh, baselining and looking for uh, abnormal behaviors. Um, the other one that used to be sort of top of mind would be something like DLP, and DLP was very not effective uh, at stopping insider risk. For one thing, we turned it off and quit and just ignored the heck out of it. So I, I do think probably tools that give you a better, uh, 
don't necessarily have a class of tools uh, you know, you know, for this, but they give you a better idea of how data is used, how it's transacted and how users interact with data. Um, that kind of data visibility is gonna give you uh, a lot of what you're, you're looking for. Then you're gonna look at things like HR systems, you know, that are feeding into some of this stuff and letting you know, you know if somebody is a, uh, is a lever or if they've got a series of, you know, bad uh, performance evaluations or, you know, anything like that. So again, you're, you're putting together kind of a combination and we're seeing a lot of, um, technology platforms now that are focused on insider risk management, right? Uh, and kind of, you know, bring in a lot of these different aspects, you know, including things like case management, where you can put all your evidence together. So uh, I think it's sort of uh, pulling from you know, multiple uh, aspects to, you know, really get a good solution. Yeah, I'd say to that, uh, definitely, you know, using uh, tuning, uh, or your different tools that you're using to, under, and uh, you know, understanding the, the metrics. For example, like, you know, how many false positives is that uh, certain alert or uh, trigger generating to know whether it's a, you know, a legitimate concern or if it's uh, just noise, and being able to turn your platforms appropriately based on that uh, knowledge. Fantastic. I'm just happy my Jedi mind trick worked on JB because he knew the question was really directed toward him. I don't want to ever put anybody in a situation where they have to talk about like what tools they would recommend. So well played, JB. You the, the Star Wars analogies have definitely uh, come across. OK, we, we, are, we are almost at time. And one of the things I like to do is ask my humdinger question, which is like, what have I been thinking about this whole time? Something that's resonated with me that everybody will, will have a few seconds to answer and, and then we'll wrap up. So here's, here's my question. And I'll chime in on this, too, but I'll go last so I can get the best of everything and formulate my answer. But here's my question to everybody. Who owns risk in the organization? And we'll start with you, Claire. Oh, loaded question, which we all know. Um, I think everyone does. And here's a here's a nice neutral answer. We all do, right? We are all the ones who have to think twice about leaving a door open, um, think twice about you know where we're sharing information, think twice about how strong our passwords are. Um, you know, when you get when you get click on that fish, you know, are you responsible? So we all own risk. Um, we just hope that there are controls in place to help protect us and guide us in the right direction. Brandon? I agree with that. There's all, uh, everybody has a part in managing risk at, for the organization and you know everybody has to do their part and uh, ultimately drive down risk uh, holistically. Love it. Sam? So I 100% agree. I've just been trying to think through this also about like who really add this because there's so many different types of risk. Who's going to own it? I'm not going to go back to the guy last week. It was like the risk team because <laughs> um, that was <laughs> it was. I mean, yes, but no. Um, but depending on your type of company, yes, the board have got to be involved. I mean, it's, this this has to go all the way up. It can't just be a security problem or an IT problem or a legal or an HR. Um, this has to start at the top, and if because if it's not at the top. You can't expect the people at the bottom to care about it. JB, you get the closing uh, statement. Wow. Yeah, I have to echo everybody here, right? Risk is everybody's problem. But uh, yeah, as Sam pointed out, it's ultimately a board responsibility. The board is responsible for managing company risk. Uh, so as you see, you know, folks that uh, are under spending or under focused on things like uh, like security, uh, that is directly reflective of how the board views risk. Uh, if it's not reflective of how the board uh, views risk, then the board uh, is not leaning forward into the problem. Yeah, these are these are excellent insights, and and I I can do nothing but agree with everything that's been said. Right, I I think the idea, the notion of risk, it, it usually means different things to different groups. Right, like the executives might call it business continuity. Well, what are they really trying to say? Right, when they talk about growth, when they talk about minimizing risk, they're ba they're essentially saying, hey, we need to grow as a business. We need to protect our business, our assets, our financials, our brand. All of this equals you must reduce risk, and I. I think there's a general understanding that you never get to like the zero state of risk. You're always inheriting some risk, which is enabling you to take those decisions. But 
I think we're all on the same page, right? About everybody owns this risk and play. I love your example of something as simple as leaving a door open, right? Everybody's accountable with like ensuring their badges are with them. It, it goes just beyond the realm of security. So, and into, you know, physical security as well. So fantastic. Thank you for all your insights. I am going to close things out here very quickly. Um, but I can't do that without thanking our sponsors, Code42, Xbeam, um, Optiv. Uh, again, fantastic insights from all of our speakers. Thank you for, uh, you know, for fielding those questions. And you know, one thing I, I do want to say is like, just because we have come to an end here on this platform, that doesn't mean the conversation has to end either. I think some of the best conversations actually occur away from webinars at times, right? So take note of the QR code. Um, join the uh, Insider Risk Knowledge uh, Share Slack community. There's a lot of really good uh, questions, discussions that, that are occur there. Uh, and then, of course, you know, follow us on social, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, if Sam hasn't made the point right, social is, is a great place, a great platform for, for a lot of these ongoing discussions. And hopefully, I think that the last thing I want to leave you with is hopefully this has been educational, it's been insightful. The goal here, again, is to stay very much away from sales. I mean, you'll attend enough webinars that, that, that you know, will we'll deal with that aspect of it. Our focus is education. Our focus is insights. What can we bring as a community uh, in terms of having a discussion, sharing insights that will really serve and help grow this category? So if we ever veer away from that, hold us accountable. Make sure that we're always in line. But we're excited to bring you the next Trailblazer. Um, stay tuned for dates on that. But in the meantime, thank you, take care, and we will see you again very soon. Bye for now.